Uh -huh. Okay, and it's gonna record on the cloud. And we'll go ahead and here's some participants flooding in. All right. I'm ready. Great. All right, hi everybody. Uh, we are recording this meeting. And we will start in just a couple minutes. We'll see if there's anyone left to log on. Let's see. All right, got some more people coming. That's great. Okay. <laughs> we uh, or I've got a little one here with me, so that's the noise you hear in the background. It won't last long. We'll just be here for the introduction. <laughs> Okay, some more people have joined. Good deal. Okay, so I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Um, I'm Allison. I'm a therapist at Turning Point. And today we have Hannah with us. She is going to be our presenter. Um, so, and we will get that going here in just a second. Oh, goodness. <laughs> this is Jones trying to make some noise here. Um, but yeah, so we are recording this meeting for um, everybody, so you, you can either go ahead and watch it again later, or if anyone's not making it here live today, it'll be recorded, posted on our social media sites, and you guys can watch it then. Um, and we will also have a question, question and answer at the end of the session, so feel free as we go along to type any questions you have in there, and then at the end, we will answer those questions for you. We'll go through them. And that's about all my introductions. So I will go ahead and send it over to our presenter, Hannah. She is a physical therapist at Turning Point. All right. So yeah, um, thank you everybody for joining. As Allison mentioned, um, I'm Hannah. Some of you might be my patients. And so if I repeat anything that I've already told you, my apologies in advance. <laughs> Uh, but I'll be presenting uh, on exercise and its effect on inflammation. So let's see, um, my objectives, my hopes for by the end of this lecture uh, that you'd be able to understand the role of inflammation within our immune system, what it's supposed to do, uh, understand, understand the effects of inflammation on cancer and its role in cancer, uh, and to be able to kind of tell folks the effect of exercise training on those inflammatory properties or on the uh, inflammatory um, system, I guess, the inflammatory cells. So also I'd like to be able to describe the effects of the different types of exercise on inflammation. So there's lots of different exercises out there, lots of different um, gyms and schools of thought. So we'll go through a little bit of what each one looks like and how it has uh, an effect on inflammation. So for the first part, understanding inflammation, um, I'm going to talk about the phases of healing. Uh, there are three phases of healing. The first phase is the inflammatory phase. This is normal. This is the acute phase of injury or, and it happens immediately after an injury or an exposure to a certain pathogen. It is absolutely necessary. And it's usually kind of the first week and it's characterized by four signs. So I have them here just cause uh, they kind of rhyme and they make sense that way. Calorubra, tumor and dolor. What it basically means is that's heat, redness, swelling and pain. So those are the four cardinal signs of inflammation or being in that inflammatory phase. Uh, now, your blood vessels will immediately vasoconstrict or contract as an effort to protect our body after an injury or exposure, right? But then they're going to dilate, allowing more blood flow and access to that injury or exposure site. That way, all of our cells can do what they need to do during that inflammatory process. That includes phagocytosis, which is uh, basically kind of the reabsorption of other cells, foreign cells or debris by our immune system. Um, and now it can also 
absorb any damaged cells in our body, which will also be important when we talk about cancer care later on in the lecture. You can see these little guys down here at the bottom uh, to help you remember the four signs there. All right, so I like this photo just because it gives you a nice visual example of what I just kind of talked about. You've got a splinter here and it has punctured the skin, introducing all this bacteria to the area. Well, what our body's going to do, it's gonna initiate that inflammatory response. We have that injury site, and then it's gonna rush cells to this area. So you can see kind of down here where this kind of yellow tract is, those are our, our vessels. And you can see where it's kind of starting to form a clot in that area to keep us from, from bleeding. And then these cells here, uh, these phagocytes here are kind of acting like little Pac-Man for the bacteria to reabsorb them and keep our body safe. So they're gonna get at those dead cells and some of that cellular debris there. Okay. So now don't panic. <laughs> I know this is a uh, quite a few graphs here. Um, there's lots of phases listed, but I really just put this slide here to give you an idea of normal reaction times to the injury or exposure. So you're gonna see uh, these cells peak at different times. I don't know if you can see my mouse here, um, but at the bottom on the x-axis here are also the days after injury. So a lot of you might have been thinking with that first slide, one to six days, oh man, if I just had a surgery, I'm definitely feeling like I still have swelling and it's way past six days. So we'll talk about the prolonged inflammation a little bit later in the lecture, but it is sometimes normal for these things to peak at different times. Uh, the other reason I put this in here, um, this is your innate immune response, meaning this is how your body would normally and naturally respond. Uh, your adaptive immune response is different and it occurs when you've had an exposure to kind of that splinter that we just showed in that last uh, slide there or a pathogen of some kind and then your body will adapt to it to form antibodies against it or cell memory, right? That way, if you're ever reintroduced to it, your cells know what it is and can fight against it more appropriately. And the best example of this is vaccines. Um, a little bit of a hot topic these days in, in the news. So I'm sure you've probably heard a little bit more about vaccines lately. Now, another thing I wanna highlight here is you see this PMNs, Again, you don't need to memorize anything with this chart, of course, but the PMNs, it, if you're wondering, it stands for polymorphonuclear nu nuclear neutrophil granulocytes. That's a mouthful even for me. But basically, it's a type of white blood cell. And it's neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, and mast cells. Those are those different types. And basically, it's just how we know inflammation is happening in the body. Those cellular markers, if they're present, we know there's some sort of inflammatory response going on. Okay, and that'll, that'll come up again a little bit later. Okay, so next. So the next phase of healing after the inflammatory phase is the proliferative or the repair phase. So there's four important events that happen with the proliferation phase. You have epithelialization, that's if it is like a wound bed, you're gonna have new cells, new skin cells forming in there. Um, you have angiogenesis, which is the word for formation of new blood vessels. When we're healing and we're creating that new tissue to say, close a wound, um, you're gonna need to give it a blood supply because that is it's how our body and our tissues live. So it needs a blood supply. And angiogenesis is that formation of the new, uh, new blood supply. Collagen production does happen in the proliferation phase, gets a lot of uh, attention these days with, with your collagen creamers and such. Uh, so that is when this happens with healing. And then again, if it is a wound, you're gonna get approximation of those tissues. Wounds tend to heal from the diameter in, so you see a gradual shrinking of that wound. Oftentimes scabs would fall off at that time as well. And that, that again is a normal phase of healing. And then with the maturation phase, 
that occurs anywhere after day nine. And it really does depend on your body and its healing response time. Um, the number of myofibroblasts and macrophages, those are just basically those repair molecules that are gonna go in there and create some of that um, or repair some of those areas, that's gonna start to decrease. And the analogy I really like to use here, and I, I personally like to think of it almost like a traffic accident. Um, whenever there's an accident on the highway, you have police officers, you have ambulances, you have fire trucks, everybody rushes to the area, right? The site of the injury or the site of the exposure, in this case, the site of the accident. Each one has their own specific job to do. But what tends to happen to the highway? We all live in Atlanta, so we, knows what, we know what happens when there's a traffic accident. I, everything gets backed up crazy all down the road and all the side streets, right? That's your swelling that tends to happen. Um, so with the proliferative phase, the uh, ambulance is working to get anyone injured out of the area. Your fire trucks are kind of clearing the way. Your tow trucks are getting everything out. That's that repair phase and the maturation phase is hopefully where things are starting to decrease, right? So the number of those macrophages and capillaries are decreasing in the area, You're clearing things out, hopefully restoring flow. Um, this is when your collagen matures. You do have different types of collagen, quite a few different types. That could be a whole nother lecture. <laughs> Uh, but it's based on the location of the injury. Those collagen cells live in different areas of our body, uh, and they also have different tensile strengths. Now, this is really important to note, um, physical therapists, so a little bit of a physical therapy plug here. It, those new collagen fibers do require a mechanical force to, to tell them what they need to be able to perform. So that new tissue needs to be able to have a load placed on it, or like in this case, a stretch. If you have a scar, you need it to be able to move with you in whatever direction you want it to. And that's gonna help increase that tensile strength. That way you don't get that uncomfortable pulling. Now, if you don't load it in that particular way and you have this prolonged mobilization that I've listed here, that's when those kind of scars or injury sites can get a little bit stiff. Um, they're a little tender when you move and the whole tons of sequelae tend to happen. And we will go through a few of those later on in the lecture. Okay, so now um, if we think about, let's see, here we go. Why is inflammation bad? I got a little excited there. So um, short answer is it's not. Acute inflammation is not, to be more specific. It is a part of normal and natural healing. We want that to occur. We want all those different ambulances and police trucks to go to that side of the accident so we can see what needs to be fixed, what needs to be addressed. Okay, that is absolutely necessary. I will highlight that multiple times. but chronic or prolonged inflammation. Those of you that were thinking about, hey, well, I still have some of these things going on and I'm way past day six in my surgery or my, um, my injury. This is kind of what we're talking about a little bit more. And, and really that day six can be wiggled a little bit. So don't panic about that part, but the chronic and prolonged inflammation for extended periods of time. And for some folks, we're talking about years here. Um, if we think about what inflammation is with its increase in swelling, vasodilation, so like ballooning in that area, the presence of all those PMNs that I mentioned, those phagocytes that like to eat, right? And the inability to progress to those later stages where those important things like collagen lay down and, and loading of fibers happen, if we're unable to get to the, those phases, this list tends to make a little bit more sense if you think about it. All right, you have cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, arthritis and joint disease, allergies, and then COPD. Those are some, some pretty heavy hitters in, in terms of health conditions in the medical community. And if we are stuck in that pain cycle and that swelling and that inflammatory phase where muscles and joints are unable to uh, function optimally, this is why inflammation gets a bad rap. And this type of inflammation is bad. Okay. So 
So, and it's important to note in terms of this list together, these diseases are the most significant cause of death in the world. So yeah, chronic inflammation can be a big deal. Okay, so what causes inflammation? So failure to eliminate the agent causing an acute inflammation, that seems to make sense, right? Uh, these are things like, if you think about maybe a parasite, for example, living in your gut, you're unable to get rid of it. Uh, that is gonna, you're gonna have a hard time eliminating it and it's gonna continue to cause that inflammation. Um, prolonged exposure to low levels of an irritant, things like your chemicals, um, you've seen probably in the news water um, and whatever is in the water. If you're having that prolonged exposure to that irritant, you have a long period of time and it builds up in your system, that can be a trigger for chronic inflammation. Now, there are autoimmune disorders that also tend to pair with chronic inflammation, uh, specifically things like lupus, RA, um, or rheumatoid arthritis, excuse me. Uh, those are autoimmune disorders where uh, cells are being attacked repetitively, causing you to stay in that inflammatory cycle for long periods of time. So that makes sense, right? You're going into that chronic phase of inflammation. There are cellular defects that can happen. Um, these are specific kind of auto-inflammatory disorders, not to be confused with autoimmune, uh, where certain aspects of the inflammatory process um, are altered, right? So you don't have certain aspects or you're missing certain that can cause you to be in chronic inflammation. You're missing a piece of the puzzle, like you're missing your ambulance, as you can imagine, there'd be a few things go wrong if that happened. Um, recurrent episodes of acute inflammation. This uh, also seems to make sense a little bit. If you're recurrently having those bouts of inflammation um, over and over and over, your body's going to be more likely to stay in that chronic inflammatory response cycle. And then obesity. Now, this one's a very interesting one in that uh, with obesity, it's kind of a positive feedback loop. So it's particularly difficult to address or get rid of sometimes when it has an inflammatory link to it. So we know that adipose tissue stores something called adipokines, which is an inflammatory, is part of the inflammatory cycle. So if you have more adipose tissue or fat tissue, meaning uh, you're obese, you are more likely, you are going to produce more adipokines, further feeding the inflammatory cycle, making it harder to get rid of the adipose tissue, and it's just kind of a round and round. So any of you struggling with weight loss, there may be a component here um, that might need to be addressed. If you've tried lots of things over and over and over again, and it doesn't seem to be working, maybe there's a link. Right. And maybe if you try something different, addressing that link, that could be really helpful in that process and that journey and for reducing chronic inflammation, which now I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about inflammation and cancer. So diet also does play a role in inflammation and uh, chronic inflammation to be exact. Uh, I'll, I'll speak more towards the exercise side of things later, um, but it is important to address it. Um, maybe your geography in this case, if your uh, work or home is right next to fast food restaurants and things like that, the ease of it sometimes gets us. Uh, but I'll talk a little bit more now about the link between inflammation and cancer. So um, chronic inflammation and cancer, we've discussed on the previous slides that chronic inflammation does have a link to these health conditions that are listed here, right? So diabetes was one of the ones on the list. If you're in chronic inflammation, you're more likely to develop diabetes. And diabetes is linked to more than nine types of cancer. That blew my mind a little bit. I don't know if that blows your mind. Um, linked to obesity as well. And obesity is linked to more than 13 types of cancer. In addition to producing some of those adipokines, 
uh, adipose tissue can store hormones as well. There are hormone-driven cancers. Most of you are probably familiar with one. Breast cancer can be one hormone-driven cancer, prostate cancer, all sorts. So 13 different types of cancer are linked to um, being overweight or obese. Now, the human papillomavirus, that one's gotten some attention because there is a vaccine for it. Um, Vaccines are actually used in some of the studies I'm going to discuss. I'll highlight that later. But the human papilloma virus does have a link to cervical and head and neck cancers. So that virus, that inflammatory response triggered by that virus, has a link to developing these cancers. Now, with urinary tract infections, I mentioned the recurrent exposure to inflammation in a particular site can. Um, cause an increased risk of developing cancer. So urinary tract infections are a good example of that. It, urinary tract infections do have a link to urinary, bladder, and colon cancers. And this isn't to say if you get one UTI, you're going to be more at risk for these things. Uh, this is more of a recurrent basis that's discussed in the literature with urinary tract infections. Okay. So um, how? How does chronic inflammation cause something like cancer? That seems to be a bit of a biggie. And while I discussed it's linked to diabetes and um, health conditions like that and their link to cancer, um, I'm going to discuss a little bit more kind of cellular um, components of how it is linked scientifically to cancer. So this is actually a well-documented link. It was first discovered by a German physician in 1863. So it's, this link has been, <laughs> been around for some time. Uh, and this gentleman discovered a link between chronic inflammation and then malignant cell transformation. So that's that switch that gets flipped in a cell to cause it to rapidly divide. Um, we know cancer is the rapid uncontrolled division of cells. So when that switch gets flipped, that's kind of what's focused on here. There is, there is a correlation between chronic inflammation and that switch being flipped for cell malignancy. Now, when you're in chronic um, inflammation, the epithelial and inflammatory cells produce free radicals. Free radicals are basically um, unbonded oxygen molecules. So not to get too much into the chemistry here, but unbonded oxygen molecules are very volatile. So when they bump into things, um, they have a high polarity. So you can think of it like a magnitude, lots of magnetic pull. So if it bumps into things, it's more likely to, uh, and since it is free floating, it does tend to bump into things, uh, it can cause those molecules to separate from what they were previously attached to and bond to that oxygen molecule because it's so attractive, it's so magnetic. Um, now, you've probably heard of antioxidants. Antioxidants, free radicals are free floating oxygen molecules. You've probably heard antioxidants are good for you and that's why. So it helps, uh, antioxidants can help reduce free radicals. So this is what they're referring to with that. Now, um, with those free radicals, it can cause various types of damage to nucleic acids, proteins, and lipids. These are kind of our building blocks for our cells. So when those free radicals are kind of bumping into these things and causing those reactions, those chemical reactions to occur, it may activate those cells for those tissue, for tissue regeneration, right? That malignant cell transformation there. And if it is kind of um, causing reactions with DNA, it can cause cellular damage to cellular DNA as well. And DNA is what's read in a cell to perform its function, whether or not it divides. So if you're um, coming in contact with the aspect of our cells that tells the cell what to do, and you're altering that, that can be kind of the switch flip that I'm referring to there. So um, this is kind of the good news, bad news part of the presentation. <laughs> so what are the risk factors for chronic inflammation? So you have age. Eh, 
non-modifiable, unless any of you out there want to kind of slide in the comments there and tell me you found the, the fountain of youth. Age is pretty non-modifiable at this point. Uh, it is positively correlated with elevated levels of several inflammatory molecules. Uh, so that's there's also a link between free radical, radicals and aging. Um, it kind of decreases these things called telomeres. That's again, another lecture. But all those same things are linked together with age and then increasing as we age. Um, obesity, that same positive feedback loop that I discussed earlier where inflammation contributes to the storage of adipose tissue and adipose tissue produces those inflammatory adipokinase and other inflammatory cells. Um, already mentioned this one, diet, uh, when I discussed antioxidant-rich foods, but um, diet in the other direction, like that pigeon, can <laughs> contribute to chronic inflammation. Um, smoking. So smoking induces inflammation. All right, so it causes that cellular damage in your lungs, but it also lowers the production of anti-inflammatory um, cells. So it is an immunosuppressor. So it's a double whammy. It's suppressing your immune system and causing inflammation at the same time. For low sex hormones, they're referring to low testosterone and estrogen levels. Again, as we age, those both of those things tend to decrease. So all of these are kind of linked together. And then you all knew this was coming. Stress can cause uh, stress and sleep disorders. You knew that one was going to be in there. So stress can cause sleep disorders. Sleep disorders can cause stress. And both are actually independent risk factors. It could be their own bullets, but because they are linked in that regard, they're listed together here. Um, stress, both physical and emotional are identified in the literature here, uh, can stimulate the release of inflammatory cytokines. Um, some of these inflammatory cytokines are necessary. Like if we have a bout of exercise, they'll kind of calm us back down to our regular levels. But when you're prolonged to them, you, you have prolonged exposure to them, you can trigger that chronic inflammation cycle. So uh, there's also an independent positive correlation between those with sleep disorders and chronic inflammation. So that's another way we know about its link. But the one, oops, excuse me here. Um, the one thing I do want to note here is the good news part of all of this, you know, age is non-modifiable. There's a few things in there that seem very non-modifiable. Look how many are modifiable. Obesity, there's thing, interventions we can do for that, which I'm about to go over. Um, there's diet that is well within our control. It is certainly very difficult, but um, something that is technically modifiable, smoking, modifiable. Um, stress and sleep disorders, modifiable with lifestyle changes, all of these things can, well, a lot of these things can be addressed. So hopefully that kind of empowers you a little bit that there's still a lot that can be done here. So <laughs> what do we know about exercise and inflammation or chronic inflammation as we know to kind of call it now? Um, you all know the title of this lecture. You probably know I'm going to talk about exercise and its effect on chronic inflammation. What you may not know is uh, my nickname around the clinic is Betty White for a lot of reasons, uh, but and we can discuss that once you come in the clinic and see me. But in addition to being a physical therapist here with Turning Point, um, I also do the personal training here. So I can only hope that this is me in, in my future. I wanna be just like Betty White, so. <laughs> All right, so remember this photo from earlier in the lecture? It, yeah, it's back. So how do we track inflammation? So I mentioned with this photo and this slide earlier in the lecture, there are cellular markers that appear when we are going through that inflammatory process. Now, again, there's not a pop quiz here but some of them are uh, TNF-alpha, C-reactive protein, IL-2, IL-6, IL-10. Um, and then there is a senescent T-cell. Now, senescent T-cells, I haven't touched on that one yet. 
your T cells are the things that kind of adapt. Um, there are memory cells um, similar to, to T cells, but the senescent T cells occur as we age. They're less reactive as you know, um, they previously were, right? So they're less reactive than other T cells. So they're, I kind of am gonna refer to them as maybe like a lazier T cell than the other ones. Right? And those increase as we age. So that's something that um, you wanna try to avoid. You want those T cells to be reactive. You want them to be efficient in their immune response. Um, so, and then just as a reminder, PMNs are those group of inflammatory um, cytokines, the neutrophils, the xenophils, basophils, uh, mast cells, all of those, because you'll see PMN again too. I like to give a lot of reminders. So what is our immune response to exercise? So the listed here are the responses after an immediate bout of exercise. Uh, there is an increase in those PMNs shunted to our periphery. So periphery meaning not on our trunk, right? Arms, legs, limbs, that kind of thing. So if we think about what exercise does, uh, it increases your heart rate, right? You're getting your, your, your blood pumping, your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up, meaning your cardiac output goes up. Uh, your cardiac output, I don't think I've explained that yet. That is um, your body transporting oxygen to your system. So that's heart rate um, included in the scenario. There's an equation there, but you don't necessarily need to know that. So your cardiac output's just like how much your blood, blood is able to pump there. Um, and that causes an increase in the PMNs to the peripheral blood. It makes sense. We are pumping more blood, so you're gonna get more PMNs to your periphery. Um, there is a relationship between exercise intensity and immune response, meaning the higher intensity of the exercise bout, the more of a response you're going to get, right? So if you're working hard, your heart rate's up, your blood pressure's up, you're going to get more of an immune response, which also makes sense, right? Working harder, pumping more blood, getting more PMNs out to the periphery. Now, it's important to note that the cellular response decreases by 50% after only 10 minutes after exercise. So this is kind of the response time that we're talking about with the immune system. And that, as I mentioned earlier, you want to be able to have that inflammatory response. You want to be able to trigger that response, have it be efficient, address what needs to be addressed, get out and move into the next cycles, right? So this is showing that you may increase those PMNs, but they don't necessarily stay there. You're not gonna get stuck there in that chronic inflammatory cycle by exercising uh, because they are shown to decrease 10 minutes after. Now, um, the most it also shows after a bout of exercise, most differentiated cells are the most responsive. What that means is the ones that, the cells in our immune system that are most specialized to address um, specific foreign ant um, antigens are the ones that are also responding the most to exercise. Good news scenario. So the most differentiated or cytotoxic, the ones that are more likely to cause lysing of a cell, right? If it's an invading cell, you're going to kind of get at it and absorb it and address it. Um, those are the ones like natural killer cells. You might've heard of those. Um, they're designed with the most specific response or a threat response, most responsive to exercise. So um, good news scenario there with exercise. Specifically in that last study, um, it was an aerobic exercise intervention that was used. Uh, some of those individuals were, so it wasn't necessarily an oncology population, but important to note that that is our um, normally occurring response to exercise. Okay, so continuing with the immune response to exercise, there is an increase in cytotoxicity of the immune cells. So I spoke about those natural killer cells and those are the ones that are like the most specialized ones. Well, they're even more effective after a bout of exercise. They're e they do their job even better. Um, so that's an increased effectiveness of your immune system. 
and it maintains this effectiveness one hour after exercise. So when you're walking around with that exercise high, it's not just because you feel good and you put in a lot of work and got a good um, bout of exercise. You're also, your immune system is more effective then too. So you also have an increased ability of those T cells that I mentioned to produce anti-inflammatory cells. So these T, T cells are more productive. Right, they're going to produce more anti-inflammatory cells to address any lingering inflammation in the body. And then on top of all of that, if that wasn't enough, there's an increased activity of the innate immune system. So that's that acute response with those mast cells. Uh, so you're going to be more likely to uh, respond, and those are more active after exercise as well. So lots of really great things going on with exercise in your immune system uh, and keeping the efficiency of the inflammatory response without maintaining it and getting stuck in that chronic inflammatory cycle. Okay, so if we think about this, it's also going to be, a brief note here, um, it's also going to help lingering chronic inflammation. So that exercise about where you're triggering the inflammatory response, it's decreasing, but also addressing any lingering in inflammation that can be addressing um, any other inflammation caused by a prior injury that you're not necessarily working out with. So if you're cycling and using your legs, but you have had sustained an injury to your shoulder, you're gonna get benefits for your shoulder just by exercising doing your cycling. Great, at least I think so. <laughs> so hang in there. I'm going to do a few articles here just to kind of show you. We are um, evidence-based here at Turning Point, as you all know. So I'm going to share with you some of the evidence that's telling us how we're getting this information. So this Stuart et al. article, it is listed at the bottom if you're curious. Um, uh, they were divided into four groups, young, physically active, young, physically inactive, older, physically active, and older physically inactive. I switched those around, but basically covering all the bases, right? Young, old, active, inactive. Um, these four groups, the inactive individuals were put through a 12 week training program. And the other active folks, they said, you know, just continue doing what you're doing. Now, uh, for the folks that were inactive after the 12 week training program, they saw a significant increase in their VO2 max. Now I haven't talked about VO2 max, but it is the gold standard for cardiovascular fitness. It measures our ability to transport oxygen to our periphery, all right? So when you're working out, when we're um, exercising, your muscles and your tissues need oxygen. You need to be able to use them. So they are gonna consistently require oxygen and VO2 max measures our ability to give it that oxygen and our efficiency at continuously replacing it so we can keep going with exercise. Um, you may have seen one of these tests. It's the test with the Darth Vader masks and those people on the treadmills. That's a VO2 max test. <laughs> um, so these folks that went through the 12 week training program, they saw a significant, not by chance, increase by, uh, in VO2 max and strength. So, that's not to be discounted, so I had to add that one in there. And then there's also a significant decrease in those inflammatory cellular markers. So they showed there was a decrease in those markers after the exercise, not just immediately after, like we discussed in the prior slides, but overall decrease in cellular markers. Now, I have this start here. There was no change in the production of the inflammatory markers, but again, take this in context you want to be able to produce those inflammatory markers should you have an exposure to a pathogen or an injury. Okay, so you do want them to still be able to be produced, but you want any chronic or anything kind of lingering to be able to reduce. Okay. Now, another article, Spielman et al., uh, that they looked at individuals who were already phys considered physically fit. Okay, they looked at folks with elevated VO2 maxes, like I mentioned on the previous slide, and those folks, regardless of their age, had an increased number of those naive T cells. 
So again, we want those T cells to be able to adapt. We want them to be able to um, differentiate as they need to. If they're naive, they're ready to go. They're ready to di differentiate. And those individuals with um, a higher VO2 max had more of them. Um, now, there is an inverse relationship between the senescent T cells, right, the non-naive ones, the ones that are like kind of lazier, less, they're less likely or less efficient at adapting. Um, so there was an inverse relationship between those senescent T cells and cardiovascular fitness. And basically what that means is the higher the cardiovascular fitness, the lower the number of those kind of lazier T cells, and then the higher the number of those naive ones. And now if you are thinking about age here, they did track age. And for the older folks who were, the older group who did have a higher VO2 max, their immune system was performing like someone of a much younger age with the amount of naive T cells. So that non-modifiable risk factor that we discussed a little bit earlier, there's maybe a little bit more that we can do with uh, the aging process to keep our immune system young and keep our response to kind of those inflammatory cycles a little bit younger. The good news there too. Now, hopefully you stayed with me. I didn't lose anybody. Um, in summary, exercise and inflammation. Exercise can help mobilize and increase the efficiency of our immune system. There is a relationship between exercise intensity and immune response, or more bang for your buck with a higher exercise intensity. Exercise can be preventative for chronic inflammation. Right? If you're exercising and you already have chronic inflammation or you have one of those markers that makes you make kind of cancer more likely, like diabetes or obesity or one of those, it can help decrease levels of chronic inflammation. And it can help maintain your immune response with age. So y'all, I'm a physical therapist. Y'all know I'm already on board with exercise, but hopefully a few of you more seeing the, the benefits there. So exercise types in cancer, lots of different types of exercise out there, resistance, aerobic, interval, hit, all these different things. So what do we do? Um, now, specifically, I'm also gonna talk about um, exercise and its effect on cancer-related um, inflammatory side effects. Now, some of those inflammatory linked side effects are cancer-related fatigue, depression and anxiety, peripheral neuropathy, sleep habits, because we all know that is affected for someone who is in the oncology setting, right? As well as mortality, and that's a biggie. That's a biggie. So we've discussed in the previous uh, slides how exercise can help address inflammation. If inflammation is linked to some of these side effects, we can, um, we can think about how exercise can help mediate some of these side effects as well that are cancer related. Okay, but again, what type of exercise? So with aerobic exercise, a study here, it found it reduces the risk of cancer recurrence. So we know that about exercise. Uh, it can reduce the tumor incidence, which is kind of ties into that risk reduction there. Uh, and growth of known tumors. So this study found that these reduction in risk of cancer recurrence and tumor incidence and growth is actually linked to epinephrine. So that is released as we are exercising and we discussed previously how those natural killer cells are more mobilized with exercise and that is one of the links to helping decrease it. Um, now, on top of all of these things, you have, you know, the weight loss part that we talked about earlier, um, decreased uh, mortality after treatment as well. Uh, and then you're also bolstering your immune responsiveness through the mobilization of those NK, uh, NK natural killer cells. Uh, you know, in addition to that, that runner's eye, right? So lots of good things going on from aerobic exercise. Um, and if you need an example, this is your biking and swimming and hiking and uh, running. Okay. Now I did want to make sure I noted for the exer the or the 
studies that I mentioned previously in this lecture, all the ones I've mentioned previously have utilized aerobic exercise as their intervention. The 12 week study that looked at the reduction in inflammatory markers between the physically active, inactive, young and old, that was a um, aerobic exercise intervention that they were using. A lot of articles that I've cited so far use aerobic activity. You can reproduce it, right? If you're on a um, treadmill or a bike, you're gonna be able to set your settings pretty equally and then study it across folks. So that tends to be used in the research setting. Um, they're in one place, so measurements are easier to take and it is um, generalizable, right? If you say, go, run, go for a run, go for a, uh, um, go biking. That's not a specific way we do that. There's a reason they say it's like learning to ride a bike or um, just remember it. So it's fairly generalizable across the population. And I just mentioned this, keep it in mind for when you're choosing your preferred exercise. This is where the literature base mainly lives. Um, we'll talk about resistance exercise as well. Though. But again, the previous articles that I listed did have a non-oncology population. So let's talk about the oncology population. So in the study Mills et al, there were 53 postmenopausal breast cancer survivors. It's a randomized controlled trial. So there's an experimental group and a control group. And the exercise group participated in a 15 week moderate intensity training program. And that's a stationary bike, again, aerobic, three times a week. At the end of this program, their markers were measured again, and they had a statistically significant decrease in those inflammatory markers. I believe this one was TNF alpha that they looked at. Uh, so this is with postmenopausal breast cancer survivors. So it does apply to our population. So now we'll talk a little bit more about resistance exercise. And yes, it is still Mills at all. This guy's a very, or this scientist is very busy. So with resistance exercise in this study, 39 breast cancer survivors uh, were included in the study. Again, a randomized control trial, experimental group, the exercise group participated in a 16 week moderate intensity training program. So this is resistance training specifically. Uh, and it is three times per week. So it was the same kind of frequency as the previous one, but they also saw a statistically significant decrease in inflammatory markers as well. So good news coming in for the resistance exercise. Um, one thing I will say is it is less consistent in the literature base, uh, just because if, you, if I'm asking you to do resistance exercise as a therapist, I may ask you to do a row. I may ask you to do a squat. You may be doing a leg press. There's a million different exercises you can choose. And unfortunately that has not been generalized across the research base. So it's hard to compare them apples to apples to see. Um, also the timing of when they take the inflammatory markers is different before the bout of resistance exercise or after. So more research is really needed to study, uh, but preliminarily uh, research, or resistance exercise does have a positive effect on the reduction of inflammation, specifically in cancer survivors as well. Um, and then a little brief note here, eccentric exercise is more, it um, has more of a research base and it does produce similar increases in the PMNs to the periphery compared to the aerobic exercise. Um, so eccentric exercises, um, we can get into that maybe a little bit later but eccentric is basically trying to contract a muscle while it's lengthening. So if you think about a bicep curl, normally it's this way. Eccentric would be if I am asking you to resist me and lengthen at the same time. Again, we can go over that later, but it's a specific type of exercise. Ah, so if any of you have been through the personal training, you know I'm a fan of interval training. Uh, so I had to include this one in there. Uh, in this one, there were 40 breast cancer survivors studied. Now, there were three groups in this one. This was a 12-week high-intensity interval training, those HIIT exercises that get all the uh, buzz. 
and then a moderate intensity continuous training. So the interval is referring to your on cycles with exercise versus your off cycles. The moderate intensity continuous means they kept going. It wasn't a high intensity for a short period with a rest, in case you were wondering. Um, and then there was the control group that did not receive the exercise intervention to be clear. Now, they measured body composition in this article, physical fitness and cellular inflammatory markers. Now, both experimental groups significantly decreased their cellular markers, their cellular inflammatory markers. So with interval training, it worked too, but of note here, the HIT group, the changes in that group in terms of inflammatory markers were the most significant. So this is what I was referring to earlier when I talked about that dose dependent relationship with exercise intensity, the more intense it is, the more benefits you get. Fortunately, it works that way. Uh, now also of note, the body composition, the physical fitness also improved, but kind of a sidebar there. <laughs> Those we're talking about inflammation. So in summary, again, we went through the literature there. Um, the types of exercise, the effect on inflammation is intensity dependent, that dose dependent relationship. Um, inflammation is reduced with aerobic resistance and interval training. So across the board, we still saw those that decrease in the inflammatory markers. Exercise can increase the efficacy of cancer-related treatments. So this is going back to way earlier in the lecture when I talked about angiogenesis. Exercise helps with angiogenesis, the formation of new blood cells. Um, if we are forming new blood cells to first, say for instance, a tumor site, that is more going to more effectively transmit the chemotherapeutic agents to that tumor, making it more effective. Okay, so that was studied in one of the previous articles. It does increase the efficacy of those cancer-related treatments, but more consistency is needed on resistance training prescription moving forward to get a larger base of, of information there. All right, so bringing it on home. Acute inflammation is normal and necessary, while chronic inflammation is linked to the development of serious health conditions, cancer included. Chronic inflammation is linked to certain cancers and cancer risk factors as well. I kind of, those two kind of go together. And then exercise can reduce inflammatory markers in the body, uh, specifically the chronic ones, decreasing your risk of chronic inflammation. And exercise can improve cancer treatment efficacy, reduce risk of occurrence, and improve quality of life. I, I had to put the exclamation point in there. Sorry, I had to do it. So that is the end of the lecture there. Um, since you all can't speak, there's a little, little applause. But if you have any questions, please feel free to go for it. I am happy to answer anything that I know the answer to. <laughs> and if not, I promise I'll look it up. We do have one question, Hannah. Okay. So far, um, Diane is asking how long on the bike during the three times a week study? Um, are you referring to the one specifically for oncology survivors? Sorry about that. Um, let's go to, ah, for the bike here. Uh, for this particular study, it was a, oh, we can't see in the chat. Awesome. Thanks, Diane. Um, it was a 45-minute bout. So moderate intensity. Um, with research, we have the luxury of measuring all of those different cardiovascular responses. So they were able to dose it um, to each person to stay within a certain percentage of their heart rate max. That way they're keeping it even because we're all a little different. We're all different humans walking around. So they kind of standardized it by measuring the heart, the response, keeping it within a certain percentage for that 45 minutes. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> and if anyone would like any of these articles, I am happy to send them to you. Um, there's a few that I'd have to get access to, but I can probably get my hands on them if anybody's interested.
Great. So that seems to be, let me double check. The, okay, here we have another question. Okay. How often do you recommend blood marker tests to review inflammation? Great. I inquired with my oncologist, but they said they don't typically use those to measure recurrence. How should we address it if we receive pushback? So first question is, how often do you recommend blood marker tests? And mm -hmm. then if you receive pushback, how should you address that? For the blood marker test, specifically in the research studies, that is, that is a fantastic question. And that has come up in previous lectures um, that I've attended. Um, the blood marker tests were conducted before the bout of exercise and then after the bout of exercise in terms of study parameters. But if you're speaking more in terms of oncology, um, I would imagine, and if we're using exercise as an intervention and measuring pre and post, you would also apply that same principle to your treatments, your oncology treatments. So um, if you have the luxury, being able to have those inflammatory markers measured um, before you go into those treatments, which you know most, most of us don't know to do that kind of thing right after diagnosis. And then after your treatments, having those uh, blood markers tested to just assess your levels. Now, how often to do it in terms of um, how often per year you should have them measured. Um, I don't know that there is a standardized uh, answer for that one. I imagine maybe yearly, if they do like a yearly blood work, you could ask them to do that. Um, if you receive pushback, um, this happens in the, in the medical community. A lot of times if you provide them with some of the reasons you're asking, you know the links to the development, um, they will oftentimes be a bit more amenable to that. Um, walking in with a research article, I have done that before um, and that has worked, but usually kind of doing a bit more of a scientific, I'm asking because I know there's a link between these things. It's been studied in the literature. You can say specifically, blah, blah, blah. Um, if whatever article you're, you're referencing from the um, lecture series today and then providing with that, I don't imagine they wouldn't test you after that. Um, if need be, you can work with other healthcare providers to request this information. I certainly would be happy to reach out for any of my, my patients who are trying to get these things, these markers measured. Um, and sometimes it helps to do it through another healthcare provider. So if presenting that doesn't help, awesome. So can you please share the article on the inflammation? So there's quite a few articles. Um, in terms of the links, let's see. Um, I can share some of the mills. I'll try to get my hands on the mills one and blood test markers, okay. Um, and I'll include that information as well, which ones are typically studied. Absolutely. And then I'm not sure how I would share that. Um, it might, I can provide my email, um, my email, for the attendees is uh, hafifi, you see my name in the Zoom corner there, hafifi at myturningpoint.org. If you'd email me your information, I can certainly send you some of the information on which markers are typically measured. Uh, and then I can see if I can get my hands on that article. I may need a little time to do that, but absolutely. Just so I can send you a PDF. Our copies are sometimes not electronic. Great, thank you, Hannah. And um, there's always the option too, if you forget how to spell Hannah's name, uh, but you can always email just the word staff, S-T-A-F-F, -F, at myturningpoint.org. And we'll be able to see it there as well. But yes, thank you for sharing your email, Hannah. Of course. Um, let me see, I don't think I see any other, please send email address. I'll type it right here. H H A F I F Y. Right. Oops. It, <laughs> H A F I F Y. It keeps um, auto correcting to Huffy when I do that at my yep. Yep. dot org. 
Okay, so I put it in the, oh, of course, I just did that to the panel. <laughs> Let me <laughs> Let's see, I can turn the in. AJ, we're going to get it. We're going to get it. Yes. Turningpoint.org. Okay. Send. Okay. We have another question. Will okay. we receive any CEUs for this webinar? Thank you. Ju that was from Judy. That is a good question, Judy. Um, a good question. We might have to get back to you on that one. Um, we can ask the necessary folks um, at Turning Point that might know a little bit more about that than us. Um, or me, I should say. Hannah might know more than I do. But um, yeah, we can get back to you on that, Judy. Let's see. Can you, Judy, can you send type your email right there? in the question and answer box. And then um, we can email you if there's a chance for CEUs. Okay. So we'll wait for, oh, there we go. I'm just gonna copy your, whoops. Email, maybe. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, Anna, are you able to copy that? Mike, I don't know why my, um, every time I click on it, it wants to go, instead of my Outlook, wants to go to my Gmail. Mm -hmm. Got it. You got it? Okay. Great. Got it. All right, so let me keep this up. I've got it being posted. And I, so far, I don't see any more questions. Give it a couple more minutes. Um, if you guys, I'm going to do some closing remarks. So if you guys think of any other questions while I'm doing that, please um, go ahead and type them out. So let's see here. Get to that for us. We would definitely want to thank um, Hannah for being here today, uh, for sharing her wealth of knowledge. That was amazing. Thank you so, so much. Um, and as you all know, we have, whoop, there goes <laughs> the baby again in the background. Um, as you all know, we have recorded this today and we're still recording right now. So that will be posted on our um, social media sites so you can go back and check on that and as you guys also know Turning Point is a 5013c and we um, survive off the support of our patients and our um, people that give people that love Turning Point so we thank you guys so much for participating today and uh, we look forward to our next event which will be in December Okay, and then to answer the question, um, can I send the slides out? Um, I can save them as a PDF so they'll go out more easily in an in a email, but yeah, I could send those out. Um, I'm not sure. I probably talked to Arellis about sending that out to attendees. Okay. Great. Double check the chat box. I think we're, whoop. I think we're good there. <laughs> and it uh, looks like the question and answer box it has been um, addressed. And we got Judy's email. We'll get back to you on the CEU question. And, yeah. and then thank you all for, for joining. Uh, hopefully it wasn't too dense and you all learned a little bit of something and, and hopefully some tricks to help your health out. Yeah, yes, we certainly did. Okay, well, thank you again, Hannah, and we will see everyone next month at our next webinar, and I hope everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving next week. Absolutely. All right, bye, everybody.